Have you ever been in charge of something? Maybe you've been asked to lead a group study, or maybe when you were a lot younger, you had to take care of the house when your parents were away. I know that a lot of you today are in leadership position of one kind or another, where you work or something like that. Now, whether you've been in charge of your younger siblings for a couple of hours, or whether you're in charge of a multinational corporation, you know that leadership involves responsibility. In fact, the higher the position of leadership is, the more responsibility it involves. You, the leader, are the one who's responsible for the success of the people around you. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of pressure. Now, Jesus had a couple of disciples named Mary and Martha. These two were sisters, Martha the older and Mary the younger. Martha was the head of the house, and therefore she was in charge of not only her household, but she was also the leader of the fellowship of Jesus' followers in her place. Do you remember when Jesus sent out 72 disciples to go before him and prepare the way for his coming? Jesus told these 72 to go in groups of two or three to different towns and look for those who would welcome the coming king. Don't bring money. Don't bring weapons. Just go into a town and find a man or a woman of peace who would welcome you and welcome your message of the kingdom, and by doing so, would also welcome me. Mary and Martha were these people of peace. They opened their house. When a couple of disciples came to their town, Martha, as the head of the household, welcomed them. The disciples then preached the message of the kingdom, and the sisters accepted this call to follow Jesus. The disciples then went back to report to Jesus and left the ladies in charge of preparing their household and their town to welcome Jesus. We need to understand that welcoming Jesus requires a lot of work. Jesus was known to travel with his students, and there were dozens of them. Even more, there was always a crowd who followed him around, whether to listen to his teaching or just to witness one of his miracles. These many people coming into town requires a lot of coordination, and so the sisters had to ask their neighbors to come and participate. That means that they had to announce his coming to their neighbors and challenge his na their neighbors to also welcome this coming king. They had to do to their neighbors what the disciples did for them, preaching the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Some welcomed the good news, some were not convinced, and some, like the Pharisees, for example, would outright reject their invitation. Those who accepted the good news then worked together under the leadership of Martha to prepare for the coming of their king. Now, this is a big responsibility. Martha had to make sure that the food, the accommodation, and all the other logistics would be ready by the time Jesus came into town. And finally, that day they were waiting and preparing for arrived. Jesus came into town. As usual, he had all his disciples with him. And then the crowd started to form to see him. Martha knew that this was it. Everything needed to go exactly to plan, or otherwise all that preparation would be for nothing. So Martha went around doing her business. She went to the door to greet the guests. She went into the dining area to make sure that everyone would seat at the appointed places. She then checked with the household staff to make sure that the food was prepared. And then she had to go out again because more guests were coming. And on and on, a never-ending task. So many people to arrange, so many things to get done. In fact, too many things and way too many people. And everyone there looked to Martha because she was the one in charge. It's her guest, her teacher, her household. This is her thing, her responsibility. Now, as you guys know, when things add up like that, when expectations are high, when there's little room for error, when everyone is looking at you and judging how you're performing, the pressure starts to add up too. And when the pressure goes up, we start to worry. Martha was worried. What if we don't have enough food? What, what if the wine is bad? What if the Pharisees decide to come just to make a scene? What if Jesus is disappointed with our hospitality? If anything goes wrong, we're in trouble. Imagine the humiliation. My sister and I would lose face in this whole town. All the work and all the preparation that we had done for this event, everything would be meaningless. Wait, where's my sister? Where's Mary? And then Martha saw Mary. 
Mary was sitting among the guests listening to Jesus. As was the custom of this time, a teaching session, a symposium, would immediately follow the feast. Everyone had finished the meal and it was time for Jesus to teach. And Mary was there with the other students listening to what Jesus had to say. The idiom that Dr. Luke used to say was to sit at the feet of Jesus. Now this is discipleship language. Jesus was the rabbi, the mentor, the teacher, and Mary was his obedient student, listening to everything that her master had to say. She was learning, she was sitting at his feet. Martha saw what was going on and she was mad. The nerve of that girl, doesn't she know that there are still a lot of things to be done? Isn't she worried with what people will say if things are falling apart? Look at her lounging around like that. What's wrong with her? Finish the work, work now, listen later. Then Martha came over to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the ministry by myself? Tell her to help me. And Jesus replied, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things really are needed. In fact, only one thing is essential. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha had asked Jesus to rebuke her sister, but Jesus turned things around and rebuked her instead. By the way, have you noticed that this happens all the time with Jesus? Whenever someone came up to Jesus to tell him that he should rebuke or condemn somebody else, it always came back and bit the self-righteous person who was complaining. It's never a good idea to ask Jesus to condemn somebody else. Now, it's important here to understand that Jesus had no problem with Martha per se. Martha was one of those peacemakers. She had extended hospitality to Jesus and his disciples. This was a good thing. She had committed herself and her household to follow Jesus. Like Mary, Martha was also a disciple of Jesus. Jesus didn't have a problem with the acts of service either. In fact, right before Jesus came into Martha's place, Jesus explained to an expert of the Jewish law what it means to love others. Jesus told them the story of the Good Samaritan, where it was the foreign Samaritan, the looked down on Samaritan who had loved the injured man on the road, not the priest, not the Levite. Why? Because it was the Samaritan who took care of him, who did the acts of kindness, the act of service to take care of the victim. And what did Jesus say at the end of this story? Go and do the same thing. If you love God and you love others, if you follow me, you must serve other people. Loving others involves serving others. Acts of service are important. The word Luke uses to describe the service or ministry here is diakone. The word, the book of Acts, clearly shows that diakone, service, is a part of the responsibilities of church leaders. Taking care of the widows, serving people food, teaching others, preaching the gospel, all of these were considered to be part of the service, the diakone, of the early church leaders. Martha's act of service, welcoming disciples, inviting others, preparing for Jesus, all these things were wonderful things that are expected from any leader. Martha did very well. Martha did what every person in the church, every leader in the church should do. So the problem with Martha here is not about her service. It's about her multitudes of service that had gotten so out of control that they had troubled her. Martha was worried, and that was the real problem. You see, over and over again, Jesus reminds his followers, his disciples, don't worry when describing different responses to people that people give when receiving Jesus. Jesus painted a picture of a tiny plant being choked to death by tangled vines. This is what happens, he said, to those who hear but allow the worries of this world to hold them back. Jesus is saying that those who are worried will never fulfill their calling in the kingdom of God because they're only concerned with what's going on around them. Worried people are so concerned with what's happening or what's not happening in the present, that they're not able to see the world with a long-term perspective, let alone an eternal 
perspective. Worried people allow crazy thoughts to creep up in their mind, thoughts that would have never come up if they weren't so worried in the first place. They assume that people are not supportive of them, so they're slow to trust and quick to blame others. They're more prone to take care of themselves. Worried people have problems believing without seeing, just like they're having problems trusting the people around them. They have a problem believing that their Father in Heaven is taking care of them. Worried people are never comfortable believing the most fundamental tenement of our faith, that God loves us. And if God loves us, then He's with us. And if God is with us, who or what can be against us? This is faith. Worried people struggle with their faith. Without faith, how can we please God? How can we completely follow Him? How can we fully obey His calling on our lives? Now, pay attention here. Jesus' response to Martha was not only meant as a rebuke, it was a solution. The only way she could relieve the pressure and the stress, the only way that she would be able to stop worrying is to do what Mary was doing, to sit at the feet of Jesus. Mary did the right thing. She did her best already to do all the acts of service that she could. She was under pressure too. But when it came time to listen to Jesus, then that's what she did. She listened to him. When it's time to enjoy his presence, Mary chose to stop whatever it was she was doing, to sit and learn. When the worries of working and leading are about to consume you, stop what you're doing and go find Jesus. This is a pattern that we see all the time in the New Testament. When the 12, the 72, when they were done with their ministry of preaching, the coming King, with miraculous signs and wonders, what did they do? They came back to be with Jesus. Jesus himself, after he has done teaching, after he had an encounter with his enemies, after he performed miracles, what did he do? He went out to a place of solitude to spend time with his Father. We're like vessels, holy vessels, because we're being used for God's purpose. And every day we must be filled with his Holy Spirit. If we're not diligent enough to seek the filling of the Holy Spirit daily, we'll be running on fumes. The pressure will get to us. We'll be worried. We'll lose faith. We won't be able to finish the race. We need to remember to stop and find Jesus. Now, some of you may be stressed out with your work. You worry that you're about to let your company down. You worry that somebody else is going to take your position. You worry that you won't be able to provide for your family. Stop whatever it is you're doing. Go find Jesus. Some of you are worried about your family. Some of you are worried because you're still single and you don't have a family yet. Some of you are worried that your past is going to come back to haunt you. Some of you are worried because for some reason, things just aren't working out the way that you want them to. Stop whatever it is you're doing. Go find Jesus. Let's listen to a testimony here of someone who, like Martha, was doing many things for Jesus. Too many things, in fact, just like Martha. And let's learn from this testimony. Hi, my name is Tirza Magdiel, and I work with the teens ministry at IS Central. I love Jesus, I'm called to ministry, and I love work, especially when I'm doing things I am passionate about. Yes. I understand that that makes me seem like a not so fun person, um, but I can't deny that I love getting to the end of the day or the end of an event and know that I have accomplished something. I'm an achiever at heart and I will do what it takes to make things happen. I love being busy. Oh, I also have the tendency to be a control freak, so that makes a winning combo for sure. When I read Mary and Martha's story, I used to always get frustrated. Why was Jesus giving Martha a hard time? She was doing stuff that was important. If you can't tell, I identify with Martha. My name is Tirza, and I'm a Martha. Five years ago, I was going into my senior year of college. 
I was doing everything, and I do mean everything. I was an intern at a church and spent about 10 hours a week helping with their youth ministry and their music ministry, which was fun. I was the prayer leader on campus, having to lead the prayer team, process prayer requests and praise reports sent into our offices, and lead campus ministry events. I worked 20 hours a week as an office assistant in one of the busiest academic services department on campus. On top of all that, I was trying to complete three degrees by the end of that academic year, which meant taking three extra credits over the full-time load every semester to that last year of school. Don't give me that look. Those are all important, right? Three months into all that, I started to crash and burn. Not so much physically and academically, but definitely spiritually and emotionally. I was so exhausted that I began to question everything. My calling, my majors, which isn't a good thing when you're in your last year of college, and my life plans. Through the busyness, I put my relationship with God on the back burner. Then whenever I have busy work to do, and that's always, my relationship with God takes second, third, fourth, fifth place. By Christmas that year, I was an emotional wreck without much of a relationship with God. I didn't think I was cut out for ministry and was looking for a different career option. I was emotionally volatile, a ticking time bomb. I was very angry at God. I was extremely bitter. I hated church even though I'm there all the time. I didn't like Christians. I was burnt out. One thing I learned was that burnout ain't pretty. I pushed on and graduated. After I graduated, I went looking for a regular job while getting ready to start grad school. It's quite ironic that the one job I got was to work with the youth at a church in Seattle. I didn't know why I did that, but it was a good thing. The church was a bit different. They called themselves a dinner church, and that was what we did, have dinner with people and talk about Jesus. It's as simple as it gets. So simple that there was nothing more I can do. Instead of doing more programming, the pastor and his wife spent so much time discipling and mentoring me. I had time to get my heart right with God. I had time to be okay. I had time to see people as people again. The two years I spent working at that church was more than anything a time of healing for me. It was a difficult yet sweet time of growth. It was difficult because I had to recuperate from learning the lesson the hard way. But I did learn. I learned to get my priorities straight. I learned about balance and how to say no. Jesus and dwelling in his presence comes first. The other stuff? will be just fine. Looking back on Martha, I now cherish the Jesus who was willing to look at Martha and in love remind her what's important. The same Jesus was willing to look at me and in love remind me of what's most important. Jesus knows that life is hard. Leading and taking care of people is hard. Ministry is hard. That's why we need to be constantly reminded and to remind ourselves to always be ready to stop and find Jesus before it's too late, before we burn out, before we lose faith. So maybe you're fine now, but maybe tomorrow when you're sitting in traffic, when you're lying in bed, sitting at your desk at work, or Maybe when you're serving in the church, suddenly you're going to be overwhelmed with the worries of this world. Stop. Whatever it is you're doing, pray. Ask Jesus to come. Ask the Holy Spirit to come, to comfort you, to speak to you, to guide you, to empower you. Don't be worried. Instead, pray about everything. Stop what it is that you're doing. Go find Jesus. Jesus.